text about in the host model, something we haven't heard of much yet. So take it away. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I'm Tom Finney from UKHSA. I head up the module team with the University of Wisconsin Department there. I kind of characterize my job as answering difficult questions or odd questions with diplomats. And I thought it would be interesting to cover this because I think it's one of the bits we haven't talked about in the sessions of the last, last day or two. And this is one of those things we have to put in time for. Um, so, in host modeling, in this, I characterize it as the modeling of the dynamics at the cellular level that will then reappear out in a population or epidemiological scale. We're not talking about molecular interaction modeling here. We're talking about sort of the, the interactions of cells with the virus and how that then comes out into the, into the rest of the world. And there, you know, there's standard reasons for doing this. Uh, the first is that there are certain experiments that are not doable, either on a sort of scale or on the level of sort of ethics. So if you're thinking about anthrax and it's interacting in the lung, and you care about the edges of the clip. So on a population scale, you're thinking about a few tens of viral particles entering the lung. You can't do gamma experiments to tell you about what the low dose regime. So you have to take the dynamics and model that down in low doses. I'm not going to talk about that sort of thing today, but I'm going to talk about the other reasons why I'm going to do this. One of those is generalization, taking what we know about a specific group of people and generalizing that out to the whole population. And I'm also going to, at the end, talk a little bit about where I think um, the whole session is about where we go next, where we go next, and how in host modeling might help with one of the, the remainder of the questions as well. So, this fits into a whole modeling chain. The difficult question we were asked is around testing. When should we test? How should we test? How many tests do we need? Should we test it all or should we test it with things together? All those sorts of things. So we're really interested in that area about disease progression on a time scale. So we've talked about SEIR levels quite a bit. Here we're going from the flow domain into the time domain. And we're really interested in well characterizing the time domain of this disease progression so that we can say something sensible about when your tests are enabled. So moving away from the problem. So this is where we stood at the very beginning of the pandemic. This is one of the very early pieces of work looking at how much virus, in this case representatives of culture positivity from swabs, you get a certain number of days from the way this was done is sort of standard epidemiological uh, route that so when people turn up in hospital with symptoms, you ask them very nicely that they did a journal study and swabbing them down every so many days until you end up done with the plan. And what you'll notice is that there is huge uncertainty in the pre symptomatic period. And I think most people in the room, yes, I've drawn a line through it, but it's totally nonsense that there is no data on this. And even if there were data, we didn't have that particular data. So we, we know very, very little about the pre-symptomatic period. But this is you know, the best we can do until March, April of 2020. As the pandemic progressed, we managed to set up Human challenge studies. This is under the National Research Program Protect. Um, this is data out of Ben Barkley's lab where they did the study. And what we've got here is the average of 
two measures over time post inoculation for the volunteers. Now, note the head of the volunteers, we have a massive limit. And this is an average across the 16 people that are not. Um, first, the PCR positivity and then very low. Now, I mean, we, could, we could work with it, but human challenge studies, we're talking about a very select group of individuals who were able to join the study. We started with about 1,600 people who volunteered. By the time we passed through the selection criteria, we had 16 or so. All men, they were all in the sort of eight. 18 to 25 age group, so a very odd and peculiar population. If we look at their actual viral trajectories, we also see something else going on here. And probably this is the best slide, but you can see that some of these people have very odd trajectories through their disease. You can see that they were all inoculated at phase zero, and yet some people only start displaying the virus in their. Even on one tissue or something on scripture tract, you know, seven days after inoculation. So, again, if you can take the average, we're not really capturing it. So, what we want to capture with our in post model is the dynamics of this disease in each of these individuals and say and see if we can generalize, rather than take a true average of this, can we generalize this up to something that we've developed up to the whole population? And no surprise here, we are going to go into an open system in this sense. Um, whereas in many of the models we've seen before, we've dealt with individuals who are uh, very affected or not. Here we are going to look at a bunch of tissue cells. We're going to draw those tissue cells that go into this S2, simulate. Uh, a viral population here. Uh, we're going to catch the course of dynamic that most of the virus that produces produced by our cells is rubbish, they don't actually infect anyone um, and have a, a totally infected virus pool and a pool where, uh, where you have an infection percentage and things like that. Other studies. And we're going to include some form of immune response. Now we fit to the data using a seed type technique. I'm not going to go into the of this, but to say that we're fitting jointly at the same jointly to both um, the, the laser and the swabs. Um, Probably over specified a little, uh, the model a little bit. We did allow it to have a lonely response. In all of this work, we fixed it so that there was no breaking there. We also took our file dynamics from different studies and fixed that as well. Um, we used fairly uninformative trials here as well, and trials that would be valid, but we didn't. Actually, specify anything in advance that was particularly fine and sequence. Uh, we also tried this model without the immune response, uh, very small numbers here. So, for six individuals, it really, really mattered. For one individual, it did a few things all right, and for nine, it didn't matter. That's in there, that's kind of what I expect it to be in the tickets. But given that you know, that third group gets the people that wanted the model with better immune response, we kept it for those. And most quickly, we can reproduce the dynamics of the volunteers. Um, both in terms of their culture and in terms of their PCR positivity across the course of 
Went on and we used that in various testing models and added validation to all the other ways of using these attributes. So, this we really want to go and ask where are we going to go next? Where's, where's the last sort of series of open questions we decided to go to? Um, this is the sort of question we get. How much more disease is there? <coughs> and it's a bit of a trick question because I don't mean, well, we've vaccinated 80% of the population. How many more people are out there to get? So what they mean is, how many more people are going to be infected with all the possible variants that still exist out there in the world? Um, let's turn it into something that is slightly more honest. And say, how many more have <coughs> patients and deaths? Because that is what it is that people seem to have a higher position on the that seem to be focused on. How many more of those are we going to see? And in the context of all the variants we don't get home. Now, we can have a track of this in a very Simple way by simply saying, Well, we think that this is 
That's only for one man. What we really need to think about is getting these opinions to it and say, oh, it's mutated. Oh, we've had these changes in the genome. We can now go into final replay and it falls to the next two as opposed to the end. The next four as opposed to the end. We've had this change. We can tell really, really accurately how it's moved in genetic space. We know exactly which base pairs have changed. We know exactly what that means in terms of amino acids. What we don't know is whether that means it's moved in just a tiny bit in the immunological space. Does it mean that only a few more tens of people are going to this? Or is it some kind of complete escape where it's completely moved? And now everyone. Now, SARS CoV 2, compared to many of the other diseases out there, is actually quite consistent. It's got one ish receptors, and you don't see that it's very much movement of any things that you can do. It doesn't do weird things like blue, which swap out whole chunks of its gene. So, we have at least a chance that trying to characterize this map between sequence and what that might be. Well characterized, you don't know the, the, the genetic change of that people. Immunological space is a little less defined, and I think again a few of you in the room would have seen these neutralization study results. You've got some kind of wild type and hyper and beta there. And there is some drop in the amount of neutralization that the system is producing. I would argue that actually we probably shouldn't be thinking too much about the antibody status. It's about transmission, but we really just hope to be the consequences. But we could characterize the immune space as well. So to antibodies. What we might Want to do is characterize the immune space in terms of T cell repertoire, and particularly there, I think there's a whole chunk of work for immunologists to look at and look at repeated motifs in T cell repertoires across vaccinated individuals versus people who have a natural infection of Delta versus people who have a natural infection of Delta. Far too hard. Put that aside, but I think that would be where And instead, I'm going to point my hand and say, well, actually, what we need to look at is perhaps the, the binding ability to the spectrum. If we do that, we can adapt our descriptive model, we can turn it into a strange model, we can then take our competing strains model and adapt it again so that we have some kind of map of some kind of uh, loci within it. And if we've done that, we get a nice progression of different, different strains coming up from the border array at the time of their current mutations. And you can see a couple of number of runs that those give you a seed progression. Now, as I said, this is no progression, it's a work in progress. It's not a little bit further, we've actually mapped those particular uh, mutations to the ones that matter in terms of the spine protein. We've got a couple of those there into the spine core. The real one 
bigger and bigger and more so immunologists to look at immunological models is we need to think about immunological models. We can model it simply and specifically something we want to do, but actually we need to think about T cells versus We also probably need to go back and look at all the computer states. And so it's they're just consistent, but in more frequencies than you don't need to go back to think about how that can be. So final thoughts really in host matters. And it matters because we can see that we can do our parameters. So you Looked at, well, we no longer have to believe that it sits in a different place. It sits in a different place for reasons like the cellular level, in fact, the loss of the tetris, and we could have put that into this model. I have to check that. So it does allow us to think at how that's how that can be done. It allows us to think about how that then produces how many cells. Open sessions on SARS and that will exist for every phenomenon in markets. How much of this or how much more of this are we going to see? And of the way we're going to get over that discussion in time, time and time again. I don't know that it has not been the only answer to that question, but I think we're going to have to think about that in the future space. Um, and how much do we transfer from this one to the next one? Some of this is very, very specific. The general principles are transferable, and I think actually understanding that what a disease is doing inside the body really are transferable. So thank you so much for reaching the point about this most of the time. So thank you. All right, Dr. Oaks, well, we probably have time for one question. It's great in there. Um, great, great talk, Tom. Um, linking the question about surveillance, linking the question with vaccine efficacy, and linking your viral load profiles, are we really to start thinking about being able to do that in a real time and understand how we project those viral loads as proxies for NAPs, for example, and incorporate them into real-life modeling? Um, based on three different scenarios, for example, some people who have had no infections and are not vaccinated and not vaccinated, people with previous history of infection and or not vac vaccinated, and then different variants. Is that realistic? I don't see that. What I do know is that we're getting lots of those vaccines and they're not being significant how how it affects in vitro, in vitro very, very quickly, and not just for the vaccines. And it's an awful lot easier to get results out of that and not be able to put it in this kind of model early on before you can run a whole vaccine trial, before you can get those phase three and four trials. But you might be able to say something about what this disease is doing, or what, what the next disease is doing. Thank you, Tom, and all the speakers. We have a couple of questions now, and we're going to come up with more soon. 